A few things today out of Mark chapter 8, another one of those things that Jesus said. And I'm, I like the title of this sermon or this teaching. Um, did he really say that? Because <clears throat> Jesus says some of the darndest things, right? It's just like, wow, I don't know how we can live by this. But anyway, um, it's Mark chapter 8, and we're going to be teaching out of, uh, I'll be sharing this last part of chapter 8, verses 34 through chapter 1, verse 9, but the last section of chapter 8, if you got that, look up at me so I know you have that. Everybody's got it, a thumbs up, all right, awesome. He said, this is what he said, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Verse 35. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel, would you circle that in your Bible right there? It says, lose it for his life, thank you, and for the gospel will save it. Verse 36, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forget, forgets his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my word in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory and the holy angels. And then he said to them, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see this kingdom of God come with power. Let's pray. Amen. Father, I thank you again for your word. <clears throat> I ask you, Lord, to use it to challenge our very souls to be fully persuaded that you are Lord over every situation in our lives. And Father, I thank you for that. Anoint this time to challenge where we're at with you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. We were studying, we've been studying in our missional communities um, the first chapter uh, of our, our Gospel Fluency book. And it, it was about, it's, the first chapter is about unbelief. <clears throat> An author, Jeff Vanderstel, challenges us to say it's not unbelief just to say that those that are Christians are believers and those that are not are unbelievers. He was challenging us to look at ourselves and say there might be some unbeliefs in areas of your life that you haven't totally surrendered to God. Now, I really appreciate Rajiv and, and Hepsua's testimony this morning because I might, now that I, get, I can use it a little bit, right? So as they were going through this last year, because it's been a while since uh, Rajiv has said, I don't know how many years now, that they wanted to get Hepzibah's a visa so she could work visa, so she could work, but because of this, you know, the, the uh, visa situation, he can't do that all the time. So uh, it's been something we've been praying about for a long time. You know, not only us, but I think I, I forgot to pray sometimes. Not that I prayed all the time for you, but I, I'll be honest with you, just sometimes I remember and I pray, right? And um, I know, but I know they've been dealing with that, so you, they pray all the time. And I know they're, they're coming through a challenge in their lives where they had to, there was unbelief that, is this really going to happen? And then the transition from, no, God's going to do this. You've been in that situation? Where, you know, you, you, you don't really, is it going to happen? And you try to figure it out yourself. And then you have to say, no, I believe God's going to help me through this situation if I just totally surrender my belief in Him. So I get rid of the unbelief out of my life and say, Lord, help me with my unbelief and help me believe that you have my good interest at heart, that you know all things, that you want the best for me. Amen? And God did it. So that's what we've been challenging. And so in our books, we had to write down what areas of unbelief do we have, right? Could you do that right now? Like write down on a piece of paper, what areas do you believe God in? And then we're just going to pray about it and you're going to have belief in that area. Today, right? Right now, can we do that? No, I was, I was trying to tell you. That, that is an area. So how many, I mean, be honest with yourself, there's an area that we need to really believe God in and trust Him 
over our situation. And he said he would come through if you would only believe. Now I hope I don't, you know, I, don't, I hope you're not like Rajin and Jeevan Hospital where you, you got to get down to zero in the checking account. I don't know, sometimes it's just, sometimes that's where we're at, right? So our greatest victories in God has always been when we needed Him the most, right? God does that. Why does He do that to us? Why does He take us to a place where, right at the edge of our, I have to hang on, I have to say default, if you will, to Jesus over every other's belief or or possibility to take care of my situation. I'm trusting God. Maybe we should just hang out there for a minute. Also, that's not, there's a lot of notes here, but anyway. Let's just hang out there for a minute. Where does belief override unbelief in our personal lives? Like in everything, in our marriage, in our finances. I'm thinking, I'm thinking about church growth for a minute. I think like, man, if we had more believers that would have to say, yeah, I can go out and go out and conquer the world and win the world for Jesus and Lord help my unbelief that we can actually do that. That's my heart anyway. I was talking to Kevin last night. I said, maybe we need to go out two by two and just practice a little bit of challenging ourselves to go out there and share Jesus with a lost and dying and what did Jesus call it right here? Um... Uh, an adulterous and sinful generation. <laughs> I think like that's 2018 right there. It's like we don't have to go back to what it was back years ago, but it, it's, it's something that we can look at and see that it's our generation right now. How do we overcome that? I think it's just like what Rajiv and Hesh went through. No, I'm going to trust God to take care of this no matter what, and we're not going to default to any other answer. And I think that evangelism is the same way. Anyway, that's, that was free. And let's go and look at the rest of this chapter for a moment. And let me share with you just for about 15, 20 minutes this chapter about the bread of life, Jesus, and how he describes it here in chapter 8. And now we're going to go back to this verse, and we're going to, I want to challenge you one more time at the end to say, yes, no matter what, my default answer is Jesus, okay? So let's look at verse, uh, the first part of this um, um, chapter. It says, during those days, another alert, verse 1, a large, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to eat to him and said, I have compassion on these people. They have already been with me for three days and have nothing to eat. If I stand with them, if I send them home hungry, they will, be, they will collapse on the way and be, uh, because some of them have come a long distance. In verse 4, his disciples answered, But where is this? We're in a remote place. Um, can, we, can anything get enough, we, where can we get enough food to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus answered. Seven, they replied. Then he told the crowd to sit down, and you can read the rest of that in a little bit. And then he broke bread, he prayed over it, he distributed bread. There's about 4,000 men in verse 9, it says. And, there, and had them sit, and he, he, uh, he fed them. And then there was enough left over. Look at verse 11. Uh, there's a, a warning. <clears throat> we talked about the Pharisees warning them. I said, why does this generation ask for miracle signs? I tell you the truth, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them and he went on the other side. So anyway, Jesus now comes back and he's going to explain to his disciples. Don't you love how Jesus in the scriptures always gives an example and then gives the answer for it? And we're trying to, we're like confused about it sometimes. Like, what does that really mean? So you're probably saying that right now about what I'm talking about. So let me get there. It says, Then the disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Verse 15. Be careful. Uh, of, uh, be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of, the, of Herod. So he's just talking about the unleavened. The yeast represented what in the Bible? Sin. So watch out for false doctrines, false teaching. He's warning the disciples at this time. But then he goes on and says, Then they, uh, they discussed with, with this with one another and said, It is because we have no bread. Uh, aware of their dis discussion, Jesus asked them, and this is what at the point I want to get to and teach a little bit out of this section, Why are you talk talking about having no bread? Do you not still see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have ears but fail to see? And hear but fail to hear, ears but fail to uh, 
uh, I'm sorry, did I say it wrong? Verse 18. Do you not have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets of pieces did you have to, have to pick up? And they replied, 12. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets full pieces of uh, did you pick up? They answered, seven. <clears throat> then he said, do you still not, do, <coughs> do you still not understand? And I think it's funny. How many read the Bible sometimes and go, what in the world was he talking about? Like, he just explained everything. Okay, you had this many loaves of bread, and you had this much left over. You had this much bread, and you had this much left over. And he goes, don't you understand? And I tell you the truth, if I was sitting there with them, I'd be like, no. <laughs> you know, I'm not understanding what the purpose of this is, right? <clears throat> so I want to share with you maybe some little insight about the five loaves and the bread here. Because we know all of us here can stand, I could I could ask this question, we all get a hundred on this answer. Who is the bread representing? Jesus, right? Jesus is the answer, right? Go, you go. Jesus! Yeah, he's the answer, right? So it's the bread of life. If I partake of this bread, is Jesus, this fresh bread that is in his word every day, then I have the nourishment I need to have the faith to continue to serve him with all my heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. So we look at this section. So, so what does this represent? So they had 12 baskets of bread left over to five, when they fed the 5,000, correct? So what does 12 represent in the Bible? The tribes of Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel, right? So the, this was he was showing the 5,000, the broke the bread, the leftover was representing the five, uh, the, the 12 tribes of Israel, which actually represented what? The Old Covenant, correct? Right? Am I following these 12, the Old Covenant, everything in there, right? Now this is simplified. There's a lot more study to it, but I can't get into it today, but it represents the 12 tribes. So then we have the seven left, the seven left, left over with the four thousand. Why seven loaves of, or baskets left over? So have any idea? Seven is a number of perfection. In the seven is a number of perfection, right? Right. So how does it apply to this story? Why is Jesus so important? So that if the first twelve loaves or twelve baskets represented the children of Israel or the tribes of Israel, the seven was perfection includes what? Jesus is what you saying. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is the answer. New covenant. Okay. The new covenant, but how? Right? So the seven represents perfection. If you go all the way back to Genesis, it, God included, and this is what's so cool about the new covenant, God includes everyone. All right? That's what it represents. God includes everyone in the Old Testament. Or in the, in the, with, with the seven. So from so not only did he include everybody in the Jewish families and the Jewish I mean the Jewish nation, but he also included every country, nation, and tribe after that in this seven. So he's saying, I am the bread of life not only for the Jew, but it's also the bread of life for the Gentiles. Everybody was included. Complete. Right? So the word of God, starting in Genesis, when he said that uh, he came, he built, he, well, we go back to even creation. He made the whole world in seven days. He included all of us, all people, because he loves all of us. The Father didn't, is including him. Jesus came to die very shortly after this, because the next part of this chapter, in chapter 9, he talks, starts teaching his disciples about what was going to happen to him. If you read 9, uh, um, chapter 9, he talks about the, on the, um, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the hill of transfiguration, where Peter and James uh, and John went up and saw Moses and Jesus talking together and Elijah. So he included, at that moment, he's letting them know that every people group is included in what they're about to happen. Because that's why we can go on and say, okay, so Jesus begins to continue to teach, and he has a blind man here, right? And after this teaching, he spits in this guy's out. I'm like, okay, this is, Jesus... Jesus, like, not only was he providing salvation for the whole world, he's also providing healing for the whole world. There's an example right there that he's going to heal no matter what matter of sickness and disease that we deal with. Jesus is going to heal that sickness and disease, even a blind eye. And I, I don't know, 
when Jesus, like I said earlier, when Jesus did stuff, it's kind of hard to understand. Like, why did it, so one time Jesus spit on the ground and made mud and put it in a guy's eye, right? You remember that story? But here, it's like he spit in the guy's face, like, what do you see? Well, I see people, but they look like trees. So he couldn't really see. Then what did he do again? He spit in his eye face again. A little more spit. I guess the first one wasn't enough. And then he got some more spit. I mean, God is like, I mean, okay. I want to be like, how many want to be like Jesus? Do you have the faith to spit in somebody's face? And then to be healed? What do we call the spitting church of Madison, Wisconsin? We're going to be like, Let's, well, what are you doing? It's the word of God. It says right here, Jesus spit in the face of a man, and uh, then he could see. Maybe that's the problem. We're just not spitting enough. I, I don't know. I don't. It's a, look at verse 25. And once more, Jesus put his hands on a man's eye. Then, he, it, uh, then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home, saying, don't uh, go to the village. It's his, it was saying, is, don't go and tell everybody about what happened. It wasn't, and I thought to myself this morning as I reread this again, why did Jesus say, don't tell everybody? Even as he asked Peter, we we'll talk about this next, he asked Peter, who do you think I am? And he says, you are the Messiah, you are the Christ. You are the anointed one, right? And he says, don't, don't tell anybody yet. And I always wanted to thought, well, why not? He's going around healing people. He's going around doing all these wonderful things. The crowds are following him. And he says, don't tell anybody. It's just because his time wasn't come yet. It wasn't time for this to be revealed, right? Totally who he was because he had to do what, was, what his father told him to do, and that was go to the cross and suffer a horrible death for the whole world. So that wasn't completed yet. So Jesus... Uh, I was asking, let's go, let's look at that for a minute. Verse 27, Jesus and his disciples went on to the village around Caesarea Philippi. On the way he asked them, who do you, who do people say that I am? And they replied, some say you're John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, uh, one of the prophets. But what do you, asked, he asked, who do you say that I am? And Peter, of course, had to speak up first, which is, I love Peter. I, love, I think I have a little Peter in me sometimes. <laughs> like, hey, you're Jesus, right? And uh, anyway, uh, let's look what Peter did again. Peter warned, uh, uh, wanted them, uh, warned them not to tell uh, one about tell about him. And in verse 31, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law and that he must be killed, and after three days, raised again. He spoke plainly. So that means he, they understood exactly what he was saying. It wasn't a parable. And, and uh, after this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke Jesus. I, I love Peter. Uh, but when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have the mind of the things of God but the things of man. And remember, Peter then later on denied Jesus three times before he was executed, right? So Peter was just trying to protect his friend, you know? He was, in the, he was looking in the natural. You're not going to die. The chief priests aren't going to arrest you. All the stuff that you just said ain't going to happen because I'm going to protect you. And that wasn't right. And sometimes we, look, we try to protect things ourselves and not allow God to look at the spiritual side of what we're doing. That's the hard thing, isn't it? Going from trying to control things in our natural into allowing our spirit person to listen to the Holy Spirit and do what God wants us to do in our lives. How hard is that? It's so hard. I mean, I, I think that's the thing I battle with the most. Am I going to trust God in this moment in my life? And Peter wasn't ready for that. He was protecting him in natural. But if he would have to look at his spiritual lives, and just like he did a few minutes earlier, I think about this, just a few verses earlier, he says, you're the Messiah. So he recognized who he was, but he didn't know the mission that Jesus had to fulfill. So he was going to protect his, the, well, the man that just spit in somebody's eye. I don't know about you, but that'd be like, I want to protect, anyway. Um, he had to protect, uh, he was in the natural, not in the spiritual. He, was look, he wasn't looking at things uh, as Jesus was trying to explain it. 
Verse 34, then he called the crowd. Now this is interesting because then after this miracle happened, after he was revealed to his disciples that he was the Messiah, and then it says he gathered the crowd that was there and his disciples. So there must have been part of that 4,000 that was still there. I don't know if it was a big crowd or a lot. I don't really say that, but it says crowd. And then he gathered them together and he explains what I just read earlier. This is so powerful to me because I think this is where we have to evaluate where we're at with God. But to take a moment today and say, am I going to allow God to have supreme authority over all my thoughts and all my actions and all that I do? And this is really powerful because it says like, it's like this uh, intimate moment that God's that Jesus brought those, these people together and said, here, I want to share this really deep truth with you. And I think it was like, just because just a few chapters back, I mean, just, just a few verses later, you see that he's on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's getting going to be arrested not too much longer after this. So he's like, this is one of those moments where I think Jesus is like, let me tell you some deeper truth about, so you can understand what's about to happen. Amen. And I think that today's churches need to get back to like a reevaluator. I also love going through the series about uh, the things that Jesus said that we've been going through for the last month or so. It's because we're reevaluating these these comments and, and are we really living this out today? Because I don't think Jesus meant it just for that moment, right? I think it was he was he was not only saying about what's going to happen, but I think he was also prophesying what's happening. So this applies to us just as much as it applies to the disciples and that crowd at that moment. That we have to look at this and say, this is, man, this needs to get in our spirit so we can be like Rajiv and Hesaba and trust God, right? In the moment where sometimes it, we just, there's no hope, but God has hope. And even in our finances today, and even in our children today, you know, is it bad to have your children go to Christian school? No. Is it bad for your kids to go to public school? No. You do what you want to do as a parent. But they made a decision years ago that they wanted their children to go to Christian school. So then that means you have to personally sacrifice some things so you can have your kid pay the expenses. Because I don't think they get government, uh, city funding for that, right? That does, that's not happening, right? So you have to pay the tuition and the books and the... And, Whatever else fees come up every other week, you know, we, our kids were in school too, Christian school and public school. So there's there's cost involved, there's a sacrifice involved, but it's worth it when you know you're doing it for what Jesus told you to do, isn't it? Like it's not, I mean it's a sacrifice, but it's not like a burden. Because you you hear the voice of God, you know in your spirit you're doing what God told you to do. So it's not a burden, it's just a sacrifice. Then I remember Romans says, be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And that's like laying, that, that whole verse there talks about just laying your light down on the altar so God can use you no matter what you're doing in your life. But God, I have these plans. Well, well I have a better plan for you. You know, what is God telling us to do? We have to trust Him. We've got to take our unbelief and put it aside and say, no, I'm trusting, or maybe I could just say, I'm believing God above all that I see and all that's going on around me. I'm trusting God. I'm hanging on to God for the answer of my life. I'm not going to let go of anything but Jesus. I'm going to hang on to him because he has the answers to eternal life. That's why I think my, my last thought in my head when I think about things when I'm dealing with stuff in my own life is that Jesus has the answer to eternal life. He knows everything that's going on. So I'm going to like, all the truth, I mean, everything I read on the internet, Everything I can read on my phone, you know, everything I research. I mean, even after all that, I just have to say, no, Jesus is the answer. So get knowledge, get wisdom, seek after God, but hang on to Jesus. Hang on to, uh, to Jesus with all your heart. Let's look at this last, because we cannot fulfill the last part of the scripture unless we do. Okay? I'm going to say it over and over and over. And he's like, this, this is my dad. I see it in your face. Yeah. Because this is the truth I want you to take home with you, okay? Look at this last part. It says, Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, If anyone would come would come in after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, there's a whole sermon in that alone, but I'm not going to preach too much right there. But, I mean, take up your cross. 
What is your cross? Do you, you know, Jesus again saying something. He's talking about the cross that he's going to go burden in just a little bit, and he's going to die and, and be uh, killed and and mocked and and just made fun of on a, on a wooden cross so he could, his blood could be shed for the sins of the world. And then he says, sir, before that happens, he says, take up your cross. And follow me. Follow after him. Take up the mission, the, the word of God. I was thinking about this church. I just read this this week on Wednesday. There's a church in China. And I don't know all the history behind this church. It's called Early Rain Covenant Church. Over 100 members of the church got arrested this week in China for being a Christian church. Well, part of it, I read earlier, that the reason they, they're getting persecuted uh, is because they haven't registered as an official church in China, because they have, they have this law now, and you have, there's all these rules that they have in China, and they decided, no, we're serving Jesus only. And this, one of their deep, one of their elders wrote a letter to the church saying, listen, no matter what, we're going to serve Jesus. No matter how much you're beat, no matter whatever you throw you in jail, whatever happens, this one pastor's wife had, has disappeared, they don't know where she's at. You know, they, they, they took her, and she's gone. Her son, his son, her son is in, uh, uh, at grandma's house right now, and wherever grandma goes with the son, they have uh, people following them. So they, they're, they're persecuting a bunch of churches in China. India is the same way. There's churches and people in India that are being followed, being persecuted for the gospel's sake. We don't have to worry about that here, but they're gonna, this, led, this is so interesting to me because they would not deny Christ no matter what happens. And I got me thinking this week again, like, you know, I get my mind abstract. It's probably left over from the 60s, but anyway. It's kind of, I go places. And I was thinking, like, do, if I was thrown in jail and they said, all you have to do is deny Jesus and then you can be free, how long would I stay in jail? Like, I don't know if that, do you ever, do you ever anybody think about that besides me? Kurt? Okay, thank you, Kurt. <laughs> me and Kurt. Thank you. I thought I was the only strange one. But, uh, yeah, are we willing to take up our cross and represent Jesus in everything we do, good and bad? And look at there, verse 34, 35. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Now, this is interesting to me because I can understand dying for Jesus, like I will die for my Jesus, right? I love him, he saved me, other things. But then it says, and, look at your Bibles. Does it say, and the gospel right there? All right? So not only will you die for Jesus or give up your life for him, but also the message of who he is and what he's doing for the world. Will you be able to sacrifice your life for that? We have missionaries all over the world that said, yes, I'm sacrificing my life. I'm going to parts of the world that they don't have the word of God, and I'm going to preach the gospel. Actually, one young man, if you just read the news a little bit ago, was going to this island, and I believe it was just off the coast of India, that they won't allow uh, anybody there besides the people that live there. And he said, God told me to go, and he went there to share the gospel with them, and they killed him almost instantly as soon as he got on shore, right? Because they don't want no outsiders there. I don't even know if they recovered his body. I shared this a couple weeks ago. But yeah, so, the, I mean, he said, no, God told me to go. And he knew what was going to happen. What? And it's like a young guy. This is not like some old preacher that's been doing this for hundreds of years, right? I mean, or a lot of years. This is a young man. I think he was in under 30. He just said, no, Jesus told me to go, and I'm going. So what's that going to do to that island? Like, is that like... Is that one more person that died there for the gospel that these, hopefully these, this people group will come to know Jesus because somebody sacrificed their life to go, or at least attempt to go? Bring some Bibles? I don't know what language we even have, but anyway, just, you know, I mean, just you have to be prepared so no matter what happens, happens. But it's Christmas, Pastor Bob, and everybody's happy and joyful. Like, I'm happy and joyful, too. This is the greatest time. I tell uh, Kevin last night, I love going, we're talking about buying gifts for Tina. And uh, Tina likes di uh, white diamond um, 
perfume. Thank you. It was there somewhere. Uh, white diamond perfume. So when I go to, I went, the only place I had it a couple, like a couple years ago was Macy's. So I went into Macy's and I was, I, I kind of do things intentional, right? So I'm asking a lot of questions like I'm a dumb husband and I don't know going on, but I know exactly what I want. But they had this one on sale and it was real cheap because it had an extra 15 ounces or something in the box because it was Christmas time and all that stuff. I, you know, I didn't really care about all that, but I asked all the questions that, you know, somebody that doesn't know. Like, my wife likes this perfume and it's got a gold top on a bottle. You know, they're like trying to help me. Is this it? You know, and this is. So now I only have one sales lady. I had three sales ladies trying to help me uh, find this guy. And it was sitting right there. I could see it playing this dance on the shelf. But it didn't matter. I wanted to have a conversation with these group of people so I could share Jesus with them. That's why I told Kevin. It's like, I just wanted to go through it. And then they opened the box up and they go, is this the right one? I said, no, I didn't think that's the right one. I knew it wasn't the right one. But, you know, we went through the whole process. <laughs> right? And I'm taking now just not one day. Now another lady comes, another lady comes. They're trying to figure out what I'm trying to tell. I, don't think, I think it has like uh, like sparkly stuff around the top of it too. It's like gold sparkly stuff on it. And I'm not really. And it's about this big. Well, I guess it could be this big too. You know, I don't know. And anyway, you know, it's just like I just was acting silly. And I'm, I'm trying not to laugh because, you know, my purpose is to get to know their names, get to know their story. Right? And get to buy Tina a present. You know, that's the last thing. But the most important thing is I'm going to engage in a conversation with people, hopefully in a chance to not only share Jesus with them, but maybe just invite them to church, you know? And that's what I did. And uh, I said, I'm a pastor. I'm so busy. I don't have time for this. So I'm just kind of running in here, you know? I got all this work to do. And then, oh, you're a pastor? Of course, they're going to ask the question, what church you go to and all that stuff. It's the next. It's natural. Everybody asks the question next. So you just, you know, spend, you know, a half hour talking about church stuff and people and loving on people and oh and, and yeah and we have a multicultural church we love you know everybody and you know we don't we're not really prejudiced and we're not like other churches you know I tell them all you know I tell and and um, you know we take, we don't take up time off no I'm just kidding um, but we, you know what I'm saying I just well, I want to have the conversation because my part is that whoever I meet hopefully I can engage in a conversation that will either make them think about Jesus or come to Jesus. Right? So you can be positive about life. Right, Tammy? Tammy's here. I talk about Jesus in the car. So, you know, it's just an example of that God works wherever you're at because I'm not willing, I'm not embarrassed to say I'm a Christian. I'm not embarrassed to put it out there and say, listen, I love Jesus with all my heart. He saved me from my sins. And I shared with those ladies. It was, uh, I guess if it was a camera on it, it would have been like a comedy skit. You know, that's probably what it looked like. But it was just fun for me because it's engaging in people I don't know and trying to share Jesus with them. And if they never come to church, maybe they'll just remember that I love Jesus and hopefully they'll, the Holy Spirit will use that in their life to have them come to Jesus too. But I'm not willing to be embarrassed because I think the part of this Verse 35 says, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. So there's that mockery, the, the, the uh, making fun of, if you will, that you're a Christian and, and all that kind of stuff. You just got to get past that. Like, I'm ready to lay that down so I can share Jesus with you, right? I'm ready to lay, I'm not embarrassed when I share Jesus in the marketplace because I know Jesus is more powerful than anything that's out there. And I also know this, if they do make fun of you, and they do mock you, and if they do arrest you, and they do persecute you, remember Jesus said he did it to me first. So, go ahead, take it for my sake. So the message could be sent to the world. Amen? Look at verse 30, uh, 36. Uh, um, it said, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet lose his soul? And that's kind of what you're dealing with. Am I? going to give my whole soul to Jesus and be an example to the world, or I'm not? Am I going to protect myself? And a lot of us just protect ourselves because it hurts when you get you know, made fun. Anyway, um, do so. Verse 37, or what can a man gain in exchange for his soul? If anyone, that's all of us, is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when it comes, when he comes in his Father's glory, and the whole with the holy angels. So that's that judgment time when God's going to come, right? We're going to stand before God, 
And Jesus is going to say, hey, I don't know that guy. I don't know about you, but I don't want that to happen. I want to, I want to, I don't want to be like, right, right up to that, live this whole life, the way we live our whole life, the way we want to, all the things that we do, and all of a sudden get to that point where Jesus is ashamed of us. That would be, I mean, I want to challenge you with that this morning. Like, we don't want that. We want to, I want to encourage and embolden you to be not ashamed of what Jesus has done for you. And trust him. And that means here in our testimony with each other, that means in your workplace, at home, wherever you go, don't be ashamed of Jesus. Because he, I mean, God loves us so much, he's not ashamed of us at all, not even at this moment. But if we deny him before the world, then what we're saying is, we love Jesus, but we don't love your word. See, it's, it's interesting to me how he put this in this context. Is he says, me and my word. So there has to be something more than just, I love Jesus, and I know he died for me, for my sins. It's, there's something more here. It's like, if you put the connection together, and his word. So we have to be complete in what God's called us to do. So not only did I love Jesus, you know, have you met those Christians that love Jesus, and they don't, they're not like you, there's no, you, they, you can't tell they really love Jesus on the outside? Right? Yes. You know what I'm saying? And you start talking, and you have all these comments about Jesus, but they, you can see like their whole life doesn't live. There's no, there's no outside appearance in their lives that they truly trust Jesus. And this is what the Lord is telling us or challenging us during this Christmas season, I think. It's like, let's not only say we're believers, but let's proclaim the message of the gospel to the world that needs to hear the hope that we have in us. They need the message. I'm a Christian. Look at me. I don't swear. I don't cuss. I don't smoke. I don't, you know, do all those damn right. But I don't speak Jesus to anybody or anyone because we're embarrassed to share that. And God wants to challenge that today in your heart. Amen. Because I think the Christmas season, every year, December rolls around, everybody's happy, we got the bell, we got all the, you know, all the merchants are doing their thing, and, you know, and it's all the, but the, the, I believe it's a time where people are, like, open to Jesus. There's another article, I didn't read the whole thing, but there's a lot of other religions trying to take over this time and trying to put their spin on what's happening in the world right now. And I'm thinking this is an open door for all us believers to not be ashamed to share boldly the Word of God. Right? So I'm going to challenge you. Some of us have unbelief in this area. I'm not good enough to share the gospel. I don't know enough about the Word. I don't... I'm. I, you know, Pastor Bob and Pastor Andrew are the ones who are supposed to lead people to Jesus and Kurt, you know. Um, so, you know, you know what I'm saying? So, but that's not true. That's like a false doctrine or teaching. We all, this is for all of us. This is, we love Jesus. I love Jesus with all my heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. And then it says, remember the second commandment? Love your neighbor as yourself. If we really love our neighbors, we're going to do the second part of this verse. It says, and the gospel. I'm going to put my, sacrifice myself, not only for Jesus, but I'm going to sacrifice to proclaim the good news that Jesus is the Savior of the whole world. Seven loaves of bread left over means that everybody is included in the gospel. Jewish people, Everybody, every Gentile nation is represented here. God loves us all. Amen? Let's stand. If you can. And last night we did an awesome closing, Pastor Andrew. That was amazing challenging people that were in the in the church last night that if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you don't have the gift of salvation, the gift is free for everyone that is here. 
So, but I believe everybody here has already loved Jesus. So I'm not, I'm not going to go just the other way. I'm going to say, listen, let me challenge that spot in your heart that's un, of unbelief, where you don't believe that you're good enough to proclaim the gospel to a, a world that needs it. Right where you're at right now, just bow your heads, and just you and God, you don't have to raise your hand. I don't need to count all, all, you, all this you know, people are been through, but I believe this message is for us at Capital City Church, and maybe for the other churches too, that we need to not only love Jesus, but we need to get rid of that spot in our heart that causes us not to proclaim the good news on a regular basis. Our lives shine on a hill brightly with the good news that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that He came to take away the sins of the world. And in that process, he heals the broken heart. He heals the, the broken spirits. He heals the, the physically broken. He heals all those things. But in that, he's doing that so people recognize he is the Messiah. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is Jesus, the one who saves us from our sin. So maybe you have sin in your life. Maybe there's things that you know are holding you back because of unbel uh, not only unbelief,